Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. This is uh, part four for the lecture uh, for the topic um, intention to create legal relations. So this is the last slide, last slide okay, that we stop uh, uh, in part three of the lecture. Okay, mean that here um, there are situations okay, where it will appear at first sight on the face of it, or apparently it looks like the parties had entered into a commercial agreement. But actually, if you look deeper or further, uh, there's no contract created. In that here, there's no valid or enforceable created that has that has been entered into between the parties here. The first one, whenever in uh, cases of mere paths or ambiguous word. So we have Section 30 Contracts Act, which requires um, certainty okay, whenever the parties are making a contract. You can have a look at Section 30 later on your own. Uh, and then why um, why mere path or ambiguous words are relevant or why they are being used? Usually, it is being used for the purposes of attracting custom. Okay? So, tradesmen, businessmen, they make vague or exaggerated claim in their advertisement, but they, don't, they are not ready to be bound okay, by their claim here. So, what's, what's the purpose? What's their intention? So, such statements actually are essentially statements of opinion, or we call it mere path. And they are not intended to form the basis of a binding contract. It's just a, or another related word will be gimmick, a mere commercial uh, uh, gimmick, okay, just to attract or just to promote, okay, just to promote their um, their products. Okay, but if it is a specific pledge, specific promises, then maybe it has the necessary intention. For example, okay, specific pledges here. If you can find the same holiday at a lower price in a different brochure, we will refund you the difference. So this is very specific. Okay, it, is, it shows a very clear intention that the, the one who makes the promise will give the refund okay, if uh, the promise is those who come forward and find the same holiday at a lower price. So it binds the party. So in a way, it is in the nature of unilateral promise here. Okay. So uh, if we were to refresh, okay, we can relate to the case of Kala and Kabolic Smoke Ball. Okay. Because in the case of Kala, one of the defenses raised by the uh, company, okay, Smoke Ball Company, was that they did not intend to create legal relation. They said, well, when we make the statement okay, in the advertisement, actually it's a mere business path. We don't intend to pay okay, those who uh, uh, suffered from flu after they use our medicine, but the court of appeal uh, uh, rejected this uh, um, this argument or the defense. Okay, the court held that the statement uh, that they had deposited one thousand pound in the bank uh, to show their sincerity. So this part of the promise promise or advertisement here, it was evidence okay, of intention to create legal relation. So I mean that it negates the normal intention that there's no intention to create legal relations. But here, because of the certainty of the words, because of the serious, okay, seriousness, it shows seriousness. So this is um, the uh, very um, clear evidence, okay, clear proof that yes, you have the intention to create legal relations by creating such a promise. Okay. And then again, the court will have a look at whether when the promise was made, was it seriously made or not? Okay, does it contain serious meaning or a serious intention okay, to perform it? And we have a very classic case here, 17th century case. So a statement in this case, okay, the, the rule that we extract is that a statement will not be binding if the court considers that it was not seriously meant. And this is the decision in the case of Wicks and Taibao, uh, the, uh, the defendant, uh, a firm and this is the father, okay, a firm and published that he would give 100 pounds to, to him that should marry his daughter with his consent. I mean, whoever want to, I mean, marry my daughter with my consent, I'll give him 100 pound. But later, um, I mean, he did not honor his promise here. And the court held that it is not reasonable that the defendant should be bound by such, such general words. Okay? And it was spoken, it was uttered by the father just to excite sweetness okay, to the prospect, prospective um, uh, Son-in-law, I think. Okay, yeah, all right. So the court said, well, it was not serious. The, the promise was not really serious. Okay, another uh, uh, another thing we need we want to discuss is that what if the agreement contained meaningless terms? Okay, does it negate intention uh, to create legal relations? Okay, you want to know what's the legal implication? 
So we have the case of Nicolene and Simmons, uh, 1953. And this case actually is important. Why? It shows to us, illustrates or demonstrates to us how a court may choose to allow a contract to stand. Okay, even if parts of it are meaningless. Because why? The presumption is that okay, whenever it involves commercial agreement, there is I mean, there is intention okay, between the parties to be legally bound. So um, in this case, all right, the court held that, um, I mean, the contract contained the words okay, subject to the usual conditions of acceptance. So as if okay, they had prior dealings before, usual dealings before, but actually that, that was the first time the parties entered into the contract, okay, the first time ever. So, and then uh, the court found that the parties had not done business before. So how to ascertain what's the usual conditions between them? Okay? So it was impossible to tell what the usual conditions were. But the court that uh, the court held that well, it won't affect validity of the contract here. Okay? It won't defeat the purpose. I mean, it won't defeat the. It won't negate the intention. Okay, because simply because of that. So the court ruled that this phrase okay, should simply be ignored. We just put it aside, ignore. Okay, and the rest of the contract. Um, I mean, remains. Okay, it is enforceable, valid and enforceable okay and then another justification why the court uh, i mean come to such a decision observation here it was argued that if anyone wanted to renege or fail to keep a promise on a contract then they can they can simply put uh, one mb one uh, ambiguous or meaningless term then the contract will be uh, i mean won't be honored okay or, or need not be performed so the court will i mean want to avoid this thing to happen Okay, because otherwise the party can simply avoid from performing their contract. Because why? Oh, the contract contain meaningless term. No, okay. You, I mean, cannot simply uh, evade okay, from performing the contract because of the meaningless term here. It's possible just to ignore it, or we call it um, later if you learn. Okay, we have also the remedy of severability. We can sever. We can just cut off okay, the meaningless part, and then we just uh, perform okay, uh, the, the 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 binding part. Okay, the good part. Okay, the last part, hopefully the last part of our discussion is about collective agreements, okay? Usually, it exists um, between trade union and employer. And what's the reason, what's the purpose? To regulate rates of pay, salary, and also conditions of work. I mean, this is their, um, I mean, their rights okay, to fight for the employee, okay? So, if the term of such an agreement are not incorporated into an individual employee's contract of service, usually whatever contained in collective agreement, okay, they will not be legally binding on the parties because it is meant to cover many, many people. So, it has to be individually incorporated into uh, employee's contract. For example, um, the salary, uh, the increment of salary yearly, okay, it has to be in the contract. Okay? You cannot simply refer to this collective agreement okay, because it may be different different um different ranking different different posts okay, will have or different performance okay will um be entitled to different increment for example okay so what's the rule in Malaysia okay just now the rule was actually at common law so we request the agreements itself okay it's a collective agreement so the rule in Malaysia is that collective agreement are not to be legally binding okay we follow the similar approach between the union and employer unless uh, agreement has been taken cognizance by the court. I mean, yeah, if the court actually give recognition, eh, recognize it, then yes, uh, it is binding. Otherwise, it is not. It has to be uh, included in the uh, individual contract. We can cross-refer to Industrial Relations Act 1967, uh, specifically Section 2, 14, 16, and 17. You can have a look later. Uh, actually, uh, in short, it talks about this. I mean, uh, I mean, generally, it's not binding unless it is being knowledge or recognized by the court. Okay, now we go back to England. Okay, well, the rule in England. So in England, although collective agreements are commercial, so it looks like, yeah, because it's between employer and employee, so it's commercial. But um, they outweigh by other consideration because the court will look at the wordings of the agreements, okay, the, the court will look at their nature, and the court will look at the climate of industrial opinion, okay, adverse to having them legally enforceable, okay, whether they should be given um, I mean, whether it should be enforceable or valid or not. So we have the case of Ford Motor Company Limited and Amalgamated Union of Engineering and Foundry Workers in 1969. So this is what happened between Ford Motors uh, strike. Okay. So Ford Motors and Trade Union, okay, they reached collective agreement okay, and it's pertaining to employment conditions. Okay, and um, the agreement was signed by their representative. So both, both, both parties, both sides have their representative. 
And but later they have a strike. Okay, when a union strike took place concerning the conditions, so now the company brought an action for injunction. Okay, pursuant to the agreements that they have signed. Okay, they attest the collective agreement. They said, well, this is binding. Okay, you have promised this and this, but now you uh, put a strike. Go, you you went on strike here. And unions argued that no legally enforceable contract resulted from collective agreement, meaning that yeah, there's no specific, there's no individual agreements that signed or entered into later. Okay. And then the court examined, okay, examining a range of factors, okay, and the court came to the conclusion that the collective agreements primarily considered the parties' optimistic aspiration. And actually, it doesn't have any legal enforceability, legal consequence, legal implication. So the parties actually did not have intention to make the collective agreements binding at law. After all, it wasn't incorporated into the individual uh, employees' agreement. Okay, despite that they have signed this trade union um, or collective agreement okay, between the two parties here. Okay, now we move to MOU. Okay. So the, the term or the name it reflects itself. Okay, it is self-explanatory. Memorandum of understanding, meaning yeah, the parties understand each other and they anticipate okay, that they might have a um, contract in, later okay, in the future. They might sign or they might enter into certain contract later, certain arrangement later. And normally, okay, what's the legal implication? It is a preparatory agreement for a preliminary arrangement, meaning yeah, they are ready to sign a contract later. But no, it's not yet. Okay, there's no contract yet. They are just ready. They understand each other at that uh, phase. Okay? Yeah, so the rule is that is it is not a valid contract and not enforceable, okay? No binding effect whatsoever. But again, eh, each case must be decided on its own facts because sometimes even though the, the, the name of the agreement is MOU, but it is very detailed, it's very certain. So as if they are bound straight away when they sign, okay? So MOU might give some other interpretation, okay? So the court will look at the intention of the parties, okay? Did the parties, when they sign, they intend to create legal relation legal relationship straight away or not? Or is it a just mere preparation to sign another agreement later? So we have the case of um, Sia, 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 Sia Siu Hong. Sia Siu Hong and Lim Gim Chen, they reported in 1995. And this is the, the relevant part of the judgment. Okay, I reproduce it here. In the construction of contract, okay, the court is not bound by the label. So the court, the, I mean, the court is not bothered with the label. The court, uh, I mean, the label won't determine okay, what's the real meaning, what's the, re the real implication here, right? So it's the duty of the court to construe, to interpret the document as a whole. And the court will determine from the language okay, whether actually the parties have intention to be bound or not. Despite the label attached is MOU. Maybe MOU is just, is just a label. Maybe it has necessary intention for the parties to be bound straight away. Okay, and this is what happened in the case of... Sorry. All right, where do I put the camera? Okay, I put it here. So uh, Lim Hong Liang and Tan Kim Lan uh, reported in the year 1997, uh, plaintiff and defendant, they executed a MOU, okay, Memorandum of Understanding, and they anticipate takeover okay, of certain target companies. And later, plaintiff sought to enforce the terms of MOU against the defendant and also claim compensation uh, based on the alleged breach of the MOU by defendant. But now the issue before the court is that whether the MOU was a legally binding document between the parties. And then the court uh, observed that considering the totality of the terms and conditions actually from the terms in the MOU, actually, it shows that the parties did not intend to create a legally binding contract. And then uh, in the MOU, it stated that, okay, you have to get all this approval. So in view of the various approval needed to be obtained, so it contained uncertainties, so meaning that yeah, the parties are still in the process of negotiation. So MOU, is MOU, meaning it doesn't have any legal effect. It, it, I mean, it lacks of certain um, necessary intention between the parties. But compare this with uh, the case of Ismail bin Muhammad Yunus and First Revenue in Berhad year, year 2000. The court examined uh, the MOU, they entered into two MOU, okay? But the court said, well, from the terms and conditions in the MOU, actually, Everything was so certain. Everything was final. Okay, finalized everything. I mean, everything was finalized. So the documents are binding despite their label attached is MOU. So the defense of uncertainty as raised by defendant must fail. So there was intention okay, to create legal relations between the parties. And this is also another case also with regards to MOU. Effects of MOU. Do you want to know whether there's intention or not? So plaintiff was the purchaser, so he brought an action against defendant uh, for specific performance. 
Begini yeah, you the um uh, plenty wanted to to proceed with the sale, okay, but defendant didn't want to. Okay, um plenty actually sign the for the sale and purchase uh later at a later date. Okay, it is supposed it was supposed to be signed to be executed on 8 October, but he signed it uh three days later, 13 October. So vendor didn't want to proceed, he didn't want to sign because oh you sign late, so I don't want to proceed. So plaintiff argued that well actually when we sign MOU, okay, we have a contract between us already, we are bound. Um, but here, okay, okay, the court held that now it is the duty of the court, okay, to look what is your true intention when you sign that MOU. And considering the MOU as a whole, okay, yes, MOU is just MOU here. Okay, MOU was not a legally binding agreement because you anticipate you are going to sign specific sale and purchase agreement later and then one of the parties didn't sign so there's no enforceable contract between them so MOU is just merely an MOU memorandum of understanding preparatory before they sign another uh, specific contract and for self solutions quite a recent case uh, this the, all the case here you can uh, find it in your course online okay so self solutions yang berhad and yayasan islam negeri kedah it involve jva joint venture agreement Okay. Um, all right. Again, yeah, they got look at my apology for the noise. There's a renovation work going on. Okay, we are almost finished. We have, we have, we are finishing our uh, lecture. So again, uh, in this case, the court came to the conclusion an MOU. Oh, uh, is it? Oh, uh, kan? Uh, MOU was no more than agreement to negotiate and was unenforceable. Mida here, when this, the party entered into MOU, there's uh, so many things to be done later. So it's not certain at that particular moment of time. So he lacks necessary intention to create legal relations. So MOU is MOU. I mean, it's not, the parties are not bound yet. Okay. Okay, the following slides actually for your reading purpose. Okay, uh, it talk about letters of intent. Okay. It talk about uh, letter of award as well as letters of comfort. Okay, yeah. So I give you all the cases as well as uh, example. Okay, I stop here. Okay.